waving goodbye, and, and we took film of you going by as you sailed up the Hudson and out. And Carter Emmert and some followed you out past uh, and everything. It's so good to see you, really good. And um, welcome, welcome very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome the program, uh, Sonia Ahmad. And she has been she's been involved over this last year or so directly in a most uh, incredible adventure story, as it were, uh, that, uh, that relates also to Reed Stowe, who was a young man who fashioned together a schooner, 70 feet a schooner that he fashioned with his own hands, if I'm not mistaken. We're going to get the story from her. And they set sail on the 21st of April of last year on what was billed as a thousand days at sea adventure that they were going to perform. Sonia was with him on that. She developed tremendous seasickness in the Indian Ocean, had to get off at Perth, if I'm not mistaken, and she's going to share that with us, and we have a couple of Rollins, and welcome, Sonia, back to New York City. It's so good to see you again. Hi, thank you. Now, it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Sonia, share with us a little bit of your own personal background, where you were born and raised, a little bit like that, and then we'll get into a discussion about Reed and the Anne and uh, this incredible adventure that you've had such a hand in and are just off, uh, back on, on land, as it were. But share your own background, please. Well, <clears throat> I um, was born in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents are from Guyana in South America. Mm -hmm. um, and I was raised in New York as well. Um, and uh, a typical middle class upbringing uh, in Queens. Um, when I got into my college years, that's when um, things really started to change for me. Uh, in terms of uh, becoming uh, more unique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was studying photography in school. Okay. And at, at college? Or? At the City College of New York. Okay, right, okay. Uh -huh. uh, and as I was studying, I had an interest in the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, decided to go down to the piers of New York City mm -hmm. and take pictures. Um, okay and to explore a little bit about what the waterfront was like. Mm -hmm. And as I was walking down one of these west side piers in mm -hmm. Manhattan, mm -hmm. I uh, came across the Schooner Inn. Yes, okay. <laughs> and that was about four, four years ago, mm -hmm. or a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time I thought, wow, what an amazing adventure, but I would never do something like that. <laughs> what, 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 but you haven't told who the Anne is or what it was, or maybe you can share that. Okay. You came to find that out on that very first day? Um, yes, there was a sign there, mm -hmm. and so I read the sign, and it said, 1,000 days nonstop at sea. Wow. And so I thought, well, okay, so the first thing I did was try to calculate how many years was that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would come to mind right away, wouldn't it? So, yeah. uh, uh, it was two years and nine months, and I said, oh, wow, that's a long time, nonstop, without resupply, not coming to shore. Yes. I mean, who does that? No one has, ever. <clears throat> um, not a thousand days, no. Yeah, no, never. Yeah. But uh, for hundreds of days, yes, mm -hmm. but only a handful. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was standing there reading the sign and thinking to myself, whoa, uh, how amazing. Mm. And the captain of the boat that was to go away for this thousand day sea voyage mm -hmm. was working on the boat. Mm -hmm. So me with my camera in hand, I said, hey, can I take some pictures? And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So I took some pictures and <clears throat> I was standing on the pier and, and took uh, pictures of the boat. Mm -hmm. And then he said, would you like to come and take some pictures on the boat? So there were sure. people working on the boat, mm -hmm. and you know it was bright daylight. So mm -hmm. I said, "Well, okay, I've never been on a sailboat before. Mm -hmm. Up to this point, my sailing experience was zero. Yes, zero. That's a pretty definitive <laughs> model, number. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I had been on the ferries and the water yeah, taxis, yes, yeah, but right. that's not the same as sailing. Yeah. Um, so uh, okay, I had the opportunity to go on a sailboat now. It was great. So mm -hmm. I went on. I took some pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, and the next week, I brought them back. Uh, well, not all. I brought a few prints. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this hustle going on on the schooner. Apparently, he was going sailing. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> but I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. So I asked somebody who was passing by, oh, can you give this to Reed, mm -hmm. which were the pictures that I had taken the week before. Uh -huh. And he comes out, uh, you know, 
would you like to go sailing with us? Uh -huh. right. <laughs> so I said, okay, sure. Yeah. So there was about 20 people there. Yeah. And I joined them, and um, off we went on a little sail up and down the Hudson River. I see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, just two, three hours. And um, I didn't really interact with him at the time right. then, uh -huh. um, but I did uh, meet a lot of the people who were yeah. involved with helping him uh -huh. prepare. Good group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I met those people, I spoke with them, and I, and I took more pictures. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a week or two weeks later, you know, I came back again. Um, also to give him more pictures, but also to see what else is going on with the mm. boat and the mm. project and yeah, things it's, like it's that. inherently interesting. Yeah, yeah. it is yeah, very. Yeah. So. Um, and he he was he was birthed there near Twenty Third Street in mm -hmm. Manhattan on the Manhattan side yeah. near the yeah okay yeah right on Pier Sixty Three. Pier Sixty Three, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And. Uh, little by little, I learned about the project just by visiting it uh, uh, on and off, mm -hmm. maybe once a month or so. Yeah. And this this happened over three years or mm -hmm. so. And in the course of those three years, I graduated with my photography degree. Good. Uh -huh. um, I went on, still having a very strong interest in the waterfront, mm -hmm. to uh, pursue a second degree this time in maritime technology. Okay, interesting. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I was <coughs> in the midst of doing that, uh, almost finished with one year of it. Was that at CUNY also? Yes, it yeah. was at CUNY School. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was still visiting on and off sporadically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at one point, uh, I brought a friend with me. And this was like in the middle of the winter. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there weren't that many people there, mm -hmm. and, and he was talking, oh, this is what I'm going to do next, this is how I'm preparing, and, you know, and I was by then used to his talk. Yeah. Um, he's very, he's very, he's a great guy. He really is, and a real good, you, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we know him both, but go ahead, yeah, you know him better than I, but go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, he, he likes to talk with anybody, yeah. with anybody who comes on board the boat. You only need to say, oh, what's happening, and he'll go into this whole Totally welcoming, speech. totally yeah. welcoming, yeah. yeah, real good mm -hmm. guy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about what he's doing and how he's going to do it, and would you like to help, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So me and my friend, we were there helping him at mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. um, with little tasks, mm -hmm. cleaning, organizing, mm -hmm. uh, inventorying, um, taking knots out of piles of ropes and, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he just said one day, you know, like, oh, so would you guys ever go on a voyage like this? And, you know, my friend said, oh, yeah, I would so do it, except I can't because whatever her reasons were. Yes, right. And I said, uh, no, I wouldn't do it. It's too long. And uh, maybe six months, but no, not the whole three years. Mm. And then I uh, went home that day and I thought, well, actually, what am I doing that's so interesting that um, I couldn't do this. Your marine, how did you come interested in the marine technology? Because you met Reed or the waterfront? You were interested in the waterfront it? in general. I was interested in um, what happens on the waterfront um, uh, besides, you know, the circle line, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which indeed. everybody knows. There's a gentleman, John Doswell. Do mm -hmm. you know him? Do yes. you know Captain John? Yeah. We did a program that aired last week or so about the working harbor thing mm -hmm. that they have where they're talking. Uh, and the containers, and there's a whole right. story around maritime things, and you had picked up interest in that, even yeah. the technology of it, right? Uh, well, yes. Well, uh, the emphasis on the program was not so much technology as it was um, preparing someone to go into the working waterfront of New York. Okay. So uh -huh. we would get uh, classes like safety on mm -hmm. a boat, sure. vessel maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, inboard, outboard engines. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one class where every week you went on a different kind of boat. So I a dinner see. boat on one week, uh, a tugboat another week. Mm. Um, Tugboats are fun, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think there was one sewage boat also. Uh. And so you got this real um, experience of what the waterfront has to offer in terms of jobs. Uh -huh. And I was looking at those things and I was not finding my niche, mm -hmm. but still had a strong interest in I the see. waterfront. I understand, right, and your photography, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you came to have known how Reed had come to be there, because he's from North Carolina, mm -hmm. right? Might be worth a word or two about his things before he met you, 
I mean, he fashioned that boat by himself. Right. He built it himself. <clears throat> right. Reed uh, designed and built the schooner Annie, which mm -hmm. is a gaffed rig schooner, 70 feet. Mm -hmm. um, he built it with the help of friends and family mm -hmm. on his uh, uh, front yard beach house in North Carolina. Right, right. Um, it and was a labor of love. Yes. yes uh, right. uh, and this was the second boat he built. His first boat was actually a catamaran mm -hmm. um, that he sailed to four continents. Yeah. Um, Across the Atlantic when he was 19 or something? Or very young. Yes, uh, in, either in, 19 or 20. Yeah, very young, and crossed mm -hmm. the North Atlantic, which is a treacherous sea. But mm -hmm. yeah, he's an adventuring guy. Sailed yes. to Antarctica. Yes, he did. And all of that. Yeah. After right. he built the boat, um, he sailed it to the. After he built the schooner Ann, mm -hmm. he sailed it to the Caribbean, and then he sailed it to Antarctica. Yes. Yes, in 1987, I believe yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, with uh, seven other people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and after that, even before he left for that, he thought to himself, "Well, what next?" Because because mm -hmm. he wanted to build the ultimate heavy weather sailboat, and mm -hmm. taking it to Antarctica is pretty heavy weather. It is indeed very um, dangerous. It could be yeah. seen, yeah. Uh, and and uh, then he decided, "What after Antarctica?" You know. Yeah. And. It came to him, you know, I can go away at sea for a really long time. And yeah. so then he thought to himself, well, how long? And this is how he came up with the thousand days number. Mm -hmm. He says that uh, as he was contemplating the question, he saw something like a, a slot machine go off in his head. Uh -huh. And the number stopped at one zero zero zero. And so he thought, you know, that's a doable thing. It's not too long. And it's, it's pretty long. It, it's not too long, okay. though, uh, as an impossible. It's yes. something people can comprehend, but at the same time, it's long enough that people would find it a challenge. Didn't it also relate how long it would take to get to Mars in a, sea, it, in a space venture? Yes. This came along a little bit later uh -huh. when um, Reed was, uh, I don't know how it is, he came into contact with some space-oriented mm -hmm. people. He, he's got a wide-ranging interest. Yeah. Yes. And he's an artist also. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So the, um, so uh, with the space folks, mm. uh, they were talking about what is the psychology of a person who we can put on a space shuttle to go to Mars. Yes. At, because a, a trip to Mars would be three years to go and to come back. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and he thought to himself, well, they were talking about you know, uh, teams getting along, uh, w working in a s uh, confined space, right. in an isolated environment, sure. in a, a dangerous place, right. uh, you can't come back. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, this is just like sailing. Except it's on the ocean. Yeah. Uh, so, or, or he's on the ocean, they're out in space. Yeah, right. right. Uh -huh. So these were some of the parallels that he saw right away and he started to say, you know, my voyage of a thousand days nonstop could be considered a space analogous Absolute. experiment. Or a biosphere where people are living within, you know, they have a thing where they live with, uh, within the confines of where they are, mm -hmm. and, uh, being disconnected from the outer world. Right. They went down to Texas or something, yeah. Right, but the biosphere has also controlled air flows and things oh, well, like okay, that, which okay. is yeah, okay. um, a lot more controlled. But in terms of the psychology of the people going out mm -hmm. into space mm -hmm. and also going out in, in a long distance sea voyage yeah. where they're not going to come back to land yeah. you know they have to then have a certain mindset absolutely you've heard about that because yeah you have and i wonder what the longest anyone has ever done that for up until what was the longest anyone had ever sailed do you happen to know from well experience? the longest uh sea voyage uh right now is 657 days uh -huh. um and that record is held by John Sanders, an Australian sa sailor. Did he sail alone or did he have a He was a single-handed sailor. Boy. And he sailed, he, his goal was to circumnavigate the globe three times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in a sail did. rig, in a sailboat. In a sailboat. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. that he did. Uh -huh. He was successful on that. He also holds a second place record for 400 days when he sailed around the world twice. Wow, okay. So he, 
he and Reed are cut of the same stamp in a certain sense, because Reed had this as an idea that he was promulgating when he met you. I mean, it, mm -hmm. he, he was there trying to get support, maybe, and everything from mm -hmm. corporate community mm -hmm. or something, and that's how you happened to run into him. And we might say, you're sitting here in our studio, you sailed away um, a year ago, just about a year ago from mm -hmm. Hoboken, we all saw you off yeah. and waved to Bon Voyage, and now you're back because you developed that. But he, we should just say, we'll come back to it, Reed's still at sea. Mm -hmm. And he's sailing, a single sailor now, sailing, continuing on with the voyage. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay. So that's how you met him and how you got, and then you, it began to occur in your mind, maybe you could accompany him on this venture? Right. No. Um, so it was at that point uh, about uh, <coughs> two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, that I was pursuing my second degree and, and having this uh, interest in the waterfront but not really finding my place there mm -hmm. um, and still thinking well what is it I can do next after this uh, course of study. Do you have an adventurous spirit? <laughs> my friends, uh, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> yeah, well no, I mean talk to yourself. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say that I have an adventurous spirit. Okay. I'm actually very cautious. Okay. But um, there was just something about this that really appealed to me. Yeah. And, um, I, it, and I thought, you know, why not do it? And it's, it's only, only three years, yes. <laughs> um, you know, high school, college yeah. passes by faster than that. It does it's, indeed, It's yeah. four years long, mm -hmm. so, you know, if I can do that, and then afterwards I can do whatever I want to do, you know, afterwards I'll be back. And, yeah. Um, I, I, had a, I had dinner with a number of people the other day at the Quixote restaurant with the Chelsea Hotel. They were celebrating a book about it, and they were there, and the one man who was sitting to my left, we had a conversation, went on about three hours about all kinds of things. But he's the one who helps to initiate people into the Explorers Club. Mm -hmm. And that's an Explorers Club where people trust the limits of human endurance and all kinds of mountains and things. And he said that if, uh, if Reed pulls this off, he will be one of the singular people ever that is in the Explorers Club for having pulled off such an adventure. And Reed's very much of a go get him adventures type of guy, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but yeah. you're more cautious. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I, I would okay. say so. Okay, okay, just setting the tone, yeah, okay. And so you met him and then you finally gave thought to the fact that maybe he offered, maybe you would want to accompany him and you right. thought about that. Right, so Must I thought about... Must have been a hard about, decision to come um, to. Yeah, it kind of was, because um, as I was thinking, well, okay, if I did this, then what would I have to do to do it? Yeah. What would I have to give up? Mm -hmm. I would have to give up everything. Yeah. Everything on land. Outside of that. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Everything on land, right. you know, all sense of security and uh, to go out there into into the ocean, which I had never been to before. You had never been anything except on the Hudson River. I right. Mean. Yeah. And and you know, uh, what could I do that? And actually, I thought that I could, and so I went to him and I said, you know, I'd like to go on this voyage too. Huh? And uh, you must have talked that over with your family and everything, or did you? <clears throat> I don't mean to pry. Well, because um, it was a decision I came to on my own. Okay. And, and if you come to a decision on your own, that's sort of the course you're going to set. Uh, yes. Yes, particularly <laughs> since you've cautiously thought it through. Okay, you're not you're not flighty. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. I'm just setting the tone. Yeah. Right. Mm. So um, when I told him, uh, he was actually in the middle of a sentence, talking as usual about what he was doing. Reed. And, yes. Reed has a tendency to talk, <laughs> but he talks very eloquently. Yeah. 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 It's always interesting the, th yeah. the things that he's saying too. Mm -hmm. um, and and anyway, and he stops and he says, well, "You're not afraid?" Mm. And I said, "No." because I um, had confidence in his ability as a sailor. Yeah, he's one of the best. And, yeah. um, and, and his past experience, I was sure, was going to come in useful. You know, like I had total confidence in that. Yes. And he was not looking for a person with sailing experience mm. either. Uh, he just... Why? Um, uh, because he had people with sailing experience, and they often bring their own... Uh, uh, ideas of how things should be done yes and their own um, you know for a person who's in the world of sailing 
a month at sea is a very long sea voyage. Sure, yeah. 30 days at sea is a long sea voyage. Yeah. But someone who doesn't know about, you know, what's long and what's short, then you can kind of work with them easier. Yeah, it's like you know? uh, like a tabla rasa in a sense. You can have the and also you're doing things in an adventuring way. You're not doing things by the book necessarily because you have to know the ship and you're going to pick it up as you go along and uh, hands on and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff is really valuable. I think it took 33 days for Columbus to sail away from Spain when he came to the New World, mm -hmm. and they were freaking out at the end, you know. But anyway, that's just an aside, yeah. Yeah. So um, we didn't leave immediately after I said, uh, oh, well, I want to go. But he had been saying that he was leaving in just a few months. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, well, time is short. You know, I've got to start preparing and getting the gear that I need to, uh, um, you know, have foul weather gear and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Getting my affairs in order mm -hmm. and um, I moved on to the boat shortly after that mm -hmm. and uh, that's when the real training began. Okay. <laughs> mm. uh, there I met all the people who were preparing. Him and the mm. boat. Yeah. Yes um, and it was everything from communications work, electricity, sure. um, uh, video work, mm -hmm. um, a myriad of other things. Plus, I had to learn the sailing. Yes. Uh, uh, how the ropes work. Yes. And, yeah. Um, how to store clothes on a boat. You know, it's yeah. not just putting everything it in a has closet. to be ship shape when you're right. on a boat. Right. Yeah. And and also how to deal with um, dampness, yeah. constant dampness, yeah. and um, so all these things I started to learn as yeah. I as I was there before I had even left. Mm -hmm. And a year later. Um, he finally set a departure date, mm -hmm. and so um, that was when we left. And by that time, I felt um, I was ready to go. Okay, well, this might be a time. But one of the problems is we're going to talk. We could talk for 17 hours, easy, because it's all interesting, and you do say it very well. But uh, we have, we have a couple of roll-ins. This might be a good time. You have a, a, a roll in a couple minutes that sort of introduces all of this you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. This might be a good time to roll that in now, do you think? Sure. Okay, I wonder if we could in the booth. We got that first roll in, and maybe you could, as they say, set it up. What is it, to, what is, what is it we're going to see here for a couple of minutes of video? Um, this is a read talking about what we're about to do, mm -hmm. about to go on the Thousand Day Sea Voyage. And it's a very short piece that mm -hmm. he just um, introduces uh, the Thousand Days. Okay, are you in the tape also? Yes, I am, but I don't say anything. You don't say anything. Okay, well, fine. Well, let's set up. We're talking to Sonia Ahmad, Mariner Extraordinaire, and if we could run that tape, uh, that short piece of tape, uh, and bring the sound in here so we could hear it, please. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, George. Thank you, Josh. Run that tape now, then, please, or the DVD. And if they have a little trouble, we could talk as we wait for it to come up. Sometimes they have to push the right button but and this was done um, just you knew him now then yeah and um, so you had a and this was how, how far were you in advance of when you were actually going to take off when this footage was shot was it a few a um, month or two or it, three when this footage was shot um, it was actually about a month before we we took off oh I see well, I don't know. Maybe you can give me a word. Or you can even talk to me, Willie. Are we going to be able to roll that, or is there a problem? Maybe we won't be able to. I hope we can. But I don't know if there's a problem, because we're here. There we go, maybe. Huh? We're going to black, and uh, um, I don't know if they're having a problem. To get, are you having a little problem getting the tape uh, rolling or the DVD rolling? Could you talk to me? <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, not knowing why they're having that problem. Well, maybe we could talk a little bit more because it's a great deal. You were, and then just, if you get it going, just start the tape and we'll stop talking. But you were actually on the, you actually left a year, uh, on April 21, mm -hmm. I guess, of... Uh, oh, 2007. Sailed away on a bright and sunny day. And uh, that was good. And then you were on the ship with, uh, on the boat with him for something like 305 days, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we were out at sea for 305 days mm -hmm. nonstop, mm -hmm. uh, out of sight of land, um, f uh, which is roughly about 
10 months or so. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and how did you feel on that first day when you were there? I remember seeing, I was there among the other people. We all waved you goodbye. Mm -hmm. Were you um, nervous? Were you frightened? Were you anticipatory? Or how were you feeling? Do you remember? It was, it was very exciting. Exciting, um, okay. There was a little bit of nerves um, with all the people that uh, I had to speak to. Um, I knew there would be some press there, and yeah. that was a little bit nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. um, and then saying goodbye to everybody was a little bit emotional. Mm -hmm. And then when we finally got out onto the river and we were sailing the boat, it was um, right. uh, kind of like a normal the sail. The boat that it is going away for 1,000 like we days nonstop. Had you sailed time. much? You hadn't sailed much except on the house Every the detail has been Harbor, customized right? Right. to ensure so that this schooner out sea, out can not only survive away from land for the longest the time sea. in recorded history, How'd you feel? but we'll do so with well, ease. Well, uh, it actually felt pretty you normal. See it, was okay. like from our it was like just another sail that we were on, except it was just the two of us instead of crowds of people. Yes, uh-huh. And, and there so was bigger right now we're waves. on a, mm -hmm. uh, a traditional yeah. way built right. fiberglass um, and, and steel uh, the building schooner, started to fade even though the, the interior background. is all wood uh, uh, but at the same time that first day and night it was kind of like okay so we're sailing the boat yeah, you know right and it just kind of happened okay i think sail, they got it going sail, now okay that's um, the second piece which basically oh, defines the wrong it as a piece. schooner um so you well, can see all the, the um, tackle, all the, the rigging all along the ship. Into the ocean. <laughs> There's another good luck goddess on, on the rigging. And this is where we do a lot of different things. This we is can the second piece. I guess we'll have to go. With we it. can sleep. We can uh, five steer minutes. the boat from here. Oh, you'll have to cut it. Um, this is the table just cut where we but the have our meals when the weather is nice. No, but and, the first, why didn't they run? Um, these the first are places piece? to sit down, but there are also storage areas right under here. Um, these various cleats are where all the ropes for the sails eventually come. Um, you can see we have a self-tailing winch over there, and the winch makes um, rope handling and raising and lowering the sails much, much easier. Um, and right now we're installing an electrical winch, and that makes it even easier. And so between the two winches, we should be able to um, raise and lower the sails between the two of us. Usually it would take a team of people to um, handle all the ropes and cleat them off and all that work that goes into that. Um, so, behind me you can see the stern of the boat um, and right underneath that hatch is the galley and in the galley we have uh, a little garden as well as various food things and a little stove and it's actually quite comfortable. Um, and we also, on top of this space here, uh, will be putting a little gimbaled platform. That is a, a little wooden platform that will be level while the ship is heeled over in the wind. So the ship is like this, the platform is flat, and we'll be lying down on the platform doing meditations or just enjoying the breeze and, oh, we really look forward to that. So <laughs> that's not in place yet, but it will be soon. Okay, this is the dome where we uh, stick our heads out from the pilot house, and we could see 360 all around the boat um, in bad weather. Um, it's a lookout point, basically. This is another dome that is actually acting as a protector for the antenna for the Iridium satellite telephone. And this is also another t antenna for one of our communication systems. And right in front of me, you can see one of the many solar panels. I think currently we have at least six, and we'll be getting more. This is the solar panel that will be complementing the battery power that we'll be using. So um, this is the way we'll be charging our computer systems, our phone, all the electronics on the boat. Um, through the solar panels and also um, some um, generators that we'll be uh, having. And that's how we'll get our electricity. 
and we're in the forecastle, what they call the forecastle. And usually we use this for storage. There's also one bunk to sleep in. And um, right now it's a little bit disorganized, but by the time we leave, I'm sure it'll be spick and span. <laughs> so moving on from the forecastle, we're going to head into the car. Very interesting. That's very, that's very interesting. And th that was done, and that's the Anne there. Right? Yeah, that was a tour that I gave of the schooner Anne. Um, uh, two years ago uh -huh. when I had just moved onto the boat and we were still in uh, the preparation phases. Right, okay, um, uh -huh. and so then, uh, and, so, and so that's the boat, that's 70 feet, handcrafted, hand put together, very seaworthy, very good boat, a very good ship, well done, in which you sailed out on the 21st of April a year ago and sailed down into the Atlantic, or sailed up. Where did you go first? How, how did you set the course that you were doing? And is it also true that you were going to, uh, the mission is to be a, out of sight of land or not in touch with the land and no resupply. Mm -hmm. So you had to have everything with you that was going to sustain you, and then you had to live off the resources of the sea, and some of those questions are going to uh, come up uh, in the consciousness of people who are watching. Right. Yeah. Well, um, when we left New York, um, uh, well, we left New Jersey, actually, we sailed down the Hudson and out into the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, our intended course was to go across, uh, across the Atlantic and then turn south mm -hmm. um, towards the equator. Yes. We were following the trade winds mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, the currents, uh, the prevailing currents, uh, in this case, the Gulf Stream. Yeah. Um, but a series of events kind of cut that plan a little bit different, and so um, <coughs> our course altered eventually. But um, yes, we were living uh, completely off of what we brought with us, mm -hmm. um, and so for our energy needs, we had solar panels, as you saw me describing yeah, there. Yeah, that for runs a, a iridium. You had a iridium label, uh, radio communication back to land. An iridium satellite telephone, uh -huh. which um, we could speak like a regular telephone, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, send short emails through. Mm -hmm. We didn't have internet access. Yeah, right. Okay, and I wonder if I could just uh, over, uh, just on the side say in a certain sense, read, if I'm not mistaken, as I understand it, you're much closer with him, you know him much better. But he was trying to get from, let's say, in general, the corporate community, real support to follow this and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that he wasn't able to garner that. No. From the big uh, corporations, to their detriment, didn't follow the importance of what he was doing. But he did manage to gather around him some of the most cyber-wise and the most brilliant people that are concerned with communications and doing things in a way complementary to his personality, which is very hands-on. And he has a ground crew of people mm -hmm. that are dealing with him, including Kem uh, uh, Carter Emerit mm -hmm. and uh, Paul Slatkus, I mm -hmm. think, at Good News Broadcasting and that. So uh, that's the setting in which these things are all being worked out. None of the corporations wanted to step up and back it like it should have been back and will be after he's finished. But I just wanted to put that in. Is that correct? Right. right. Okay. We, we had a lot of people who contributed goods and services. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of products mm -hmm. that were donated to us, uh -huh. but in terms of any real financial support, right. we never got that. Yeah. There was no corporate sponsor, um, and um, we could still use a corporate sponsor yeah. even though the voyage has already taken off. Yes, right. Um, uh, so no, he did not get that. Uh, As is often the case with really important artistic ventures is this never backed by the landlubbers that are safely ensconced in the harbor of successful mm -hmm. business paths in the societies from which these creative entrepreneurial people <laughs> emerge, correct? Uh, I yes. think, yes, right, okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the money that uh, corporate sponsors are willing to back are racing sailors. Yeah. That's very familiar to people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the mainstream of, of what people use sailboats for besides recreational pr um, 
uses racing, so is, the is racing. Cup and that yeah. kind of thing, and the yachting class, too, right. which tends to be associated with the very successful elements in our society. Right. There's a level of that kind of interest right. and everything. But and there used to be more interest in the sailing, and uh, there, there's not nearly there is there's going to be is what we're going to say. <laughs> well, everything. hopefully. But you were sort of on a, you were entrepreneurially on your own, and you were setting the pace for yourself to be able to live off the sea and the mm -hmm. resources available to you, which is part of a great and grand s adventure uh, uh, in itself. You can collect water, rainwater. Yes. And you're being like a, I said before a biosphere, but it's seaborne biosphere and you're going to have to depend upon the resources of the sea to survive over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so for water, we catch the rain mm -hmm. to refill our tanks. Um, when we left the, uh, land, we did leave with full tanks. We have four tanks uh -huh. that hold 1,200 gallons of water okay. in all. And um, that can last us about six months. That that if you didn't resupply at all we, from the rain, right. if you didn't supply, right? right. Okay. Just just having full tanks, four full tanks, we can live off of it for six months. That's for cooking and some bathing and that kind of thing. Yeah, and cooking, yeah. cleaning, washing clothes, yeah, yeah. every um, washing our bean sprouts. Yeah. Um, and all of that is done very efficiently, necessarily, mm -hmm. which right. is a good model because the. The naval experience, you really have to have things in order in a very efficient design sense. In right, order to there have was no wasting a drop shape. of water. Right, okay, right. good. But you still had sufficient, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you can resupply those tanks from the rainwater, and you yes. have a system set up to catch the rain? Yes, we've got two ways of catching rain. Um, on, a, on a day that's not too windy, but mm -hmm. the rain is falling, yeah. we can spread a vinyl out on the deck, uh -huh. and uh, it collects a lot of rain, and mm -hmm. uh, we have a funnel that yeah. then uh, funnels the rainwater into our water tanks right. through the deck. That's good pure water. Yeah. Um, and the second way is if it's a little bit windier, we can uh, put a tarp, uh, a vinyl up yeah. also, underneath the boom, which is um, a big wooden uh, piece yeah. that holds the sail. Yeah. And a lot of water comes down the sail. Of course, uh, I mean, you wait for the rain to wash the sail off for right, a few right, minutes, right. And, so, then, yeah. and then it's clean water. Things are pretty clean in the ocean. It's a pretty yeah, clean environment uh, compared to what we, yeah, good, yeah, okay, yeah, right. And you can do that, uh, okay, and those are the ways, and where you're able to collect sufficient water, are there parts of the ocean, as there are parts of the land, that do not have rain? You have big yeah. desert areas, I don't mm -hmm. know if you have the same at sea. Yeah. It's yeah, seven-tenths it's, it's of rather the earth is sea, I think. Something well, like that. Well, about three-quarters of the earth, yeah. Three-quarters, yeah, so um, there are areas where the rain doesn't fall, just there are areas of the earth, the land, where the rain doesn't fall at right, long periods. Right, right. It depends on how the weather, weather patterns move. Uh -huh. But um, there are some areas, even if it does rain, mm -hmm. it's hard to catch it because it's so windy uh -huh. that the salt spray from the water gets mixed in with the fresh water ah, and it's undrinkable, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. which is the problem that Reed had and is probably having right now in the Southern Ocean. Yeah. Um, it does rain there. Uh, there's, it's famous for its gales and its storms, yeah. but at the same time, it's very hard to catch water down there mm -hmm. because uh, there, the rain that falls is very short and, and it's very windy and yeah. it, it's um, interspersed with a lot of salt spray. That's interesting, and that that will contaminate the water for drinking, and right. you need that. You can't, right. and you got oceans of water, but you can't drink it. Yeah, it's, it's very there's ironic. No, there's no simple desalinization process that you could have resorted to. If you had well, to. yes, we do have a desalinator on board, it and, work? and it does work because uh, Reed has had to use it now. Yes. Uh, in these past few weeks, uh, it's um, the only way he's getting water at the moment. Yeah. Um, hopefully, when he moves into the Pacific, he'll be mov moving up more north into uh -huh. uh, smaller latitudes, and he'll be able to collect some real rainfall. We've got to move for along fast because there's so much to cover. In a sense. So one other thing, food. You have food, you have bean sprouts. They come and grow on their own, and you can replenish. They grow quickly, so that's a source. And then you can also get fish. Is that a reliable source or mm -hmm. not? And yes. then one uh, other thing is, you, I know you had a little stove on there, a little mm -hmm. wood stove. You can burn, but you have to get fuel to burn. 
Mm -hmm. He said, let's just go down to the mouth of the Amazon and there's logs floating down. <laughs> you pull one up on deck or something. But those things, that's about supply. Then we want to move on actually to the voyage, the 305 days you were right. with him and then to his current situation. Okay. Well, um, yes, we did um, burn fuel for heat. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, a lot of wood and I, about 2,000 pounds of coal, mm -hmm. um, which we burned for heat, but we actually didn't need it too much in okay. the nearer the equator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the Southern Ocean, it did get a bit cold, and maybe he lit a few fires at that time. Mm -hmm. For cooking fuel, we used propane gas. Okay, we you had, had plenty? We had 30 bottles of propane gas. We calculated we only needed maybe one bottle a month. Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, have very efficient ways of yes. using the fuel. Yes, uh -huh. um, again, for, like a biosphere. You're very efficient, yeah. For food, uh, we had um, pasta, tomato sauce, pesto. Uh, many different kinds of grains, um, many different kinds of beans, uh, and rice. Um, some of the beans we actually sprouted before we cooked because they actually yeah. get have more vitamins when they're sprouting. Okay, good. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. also made big bean sprout salads uh -huh. um, out of lentil beans, mung beans, and uh -huh. fenugreek. Uh -huh. um, th those uh, sprouts. Uh, yes, they take up a little bit more water than we would like, but mm. they also contain a lot more vitamins. Yes, and uh -huh. so we actually didn't take that many vitamins. Did you have, uh, did you have vitamins with you? And, we did and have did enough. did you have uh, something, a first aid kit you'd need? Mm. Obvi that's obvious, yeah. Right. Well, the bean sprouts um, did provide all the vitamins that we needed and were the only source of fresh food that we had. Okay. And also we had fish that we caught and dried and salted. Is it hard to catch fish in the middle of the ocean? Are there lots um, of fish? Is it, it a, is there's, it? there's plenty of fish out there. You just have to know how to catch them. <laughs> and he knew how, and you learned how. Well, yes, uh, he uh, had a system and decided that that system wasn't working, and he modified his uh, fisherman uh, abilities and started catching a lot more fish that and way. And that was his entrepreneurial spirit coming to the fore, which you need when you're on this kind of a thing. So you set sail and you went and you sailed and you were actually on the on the boat, on the Anne, and that was named mm -hmm. after his mother, it's worth mm -hmm. to say. Good fellow, Reed's to Sturdy stock. He's a great guy. I'm really looking forward to greeting him when he comes back. But you sailed, and then you sailed down into the Atlantic uh, between Africa and uh, Brazil and so forth, and then you went around the bottom of, uh, of uh, uh, Africa, I guess, and then you got into the Indian Ocean. That's the South Ocean or something. Mm -hmm. And then you developed a lot of seasickness that was really serious, mm -hmm. right? And so is it, bring us that uh, up to date on that, that you then had to debark, mm -hmm. as they say, uh, at Perth. Uh, in uh, Australia, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, around uh, November we were entering um, from the South Atlantic Ocean into the Southern Ocean. Yeah. We were just approaching that and as we were about to round the Cape of Good Hope, um, ice, the weather got rougher, yeah. the wind picked up, and the boat started having a lot more motion to it yeah. and I started to have uh, bouts of seasickness Real that was sick, yeah, right. I, oh. I had had the seasickness before mm -hmm. but it was never anything that stopped yeah, you me. You said there are different kinds of waves that you experience yeah right okay yeah. And um, uh, these uh, so the weather w started to get rough more mm. constantly yeah. and I was sick more constantly yeah, too uh -huh. and so um, I realized that you know we're gonna be in that ocean for another few months yeah it's and the weather was just gonna get more and more rough yeah. and um, that was something that uh, I felt that I couldn't keep doing, yeah. I couldn't keep being sick. just couldn't sick. do it anymore when you're sick like that. And you finally, after 305 days, you were on, that's a long time. Yeah. That's getting up. That You got a record in that, right? Yeah. You spell out a couple of those records, the longest ever for a woman or something? Mm -hmm. and the longest time a woman has ever spent at sea nonstop mm -hmm. and the longest man and woman sea voyage uh -huh. in history. Okay, um, that's the longest. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a record already. Yeah. I, mean, I hope the Guinness people are hearing all of this. <laughs> uh, you know, Guinness Book of Records. Yes, indeed. Congratulations yeah, on that. Thank you. Then you debarked at uh, at, at, at and, Perth, right? Uh, yeah, Perth. the next nearest land. You didn't come to land. You didn't come to a wharf no, or anything. No. You were you were taken at sea. The next nearest bit of land was Australia, mm -hmm. and we made arrangements for 
a boat to come out and meet us out at sea, mm -hmm. and I transferred onto the boat, mm -hmm. and Reed went on his way, mm -hmm. uh, continuing on with the voyage mm -hmm. while I went to Australia. And if I'm not, a, if I'm not, and then flew back, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the fellow that had the records was on that boat that saw you at sea, yes. so he was able to come aboard for a minute, no? Yes. Or, yeah, and say, because the two gentlemen that are setting records, they have a camaraderie that must be very mm -hmm. deep, I would think, yeah. Yeah. What um, was his name again? John Sanders. John Sanders, yeah, and he's an Aussie? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and everything, so that was there. Okay, so then you came aboard, I mean, came onto land. It must have felt odd to get, after 305 days of tossing around on a boat, to be your feet on solid t terra firma, huh? Well, uh, terra firma uh, by this point was the most welcome site in the world. <laughs> I'll bet. Um, yeah. Well, not not for the site of land per se, just uh. the fact that it wasn't moving yes. at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dear. Yes. It, uh. it was great not to be moving. Yes. And as I walked onto land, um, mm -hmm. it was a little bit strange because I expected to be moving by this time. It yes. was very habitual. Yes. Yeah. And so, yes, I did have that little bit of the, the, the sailor's walk, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. wobbling about. Yeah. But, um at the same time, it felt really good to be still, and um, and yeah. I think I, uh, the transition was not too traumatic for yeah. me. Okay, good. And then you were there resting, I suppose, for a while, and then flew back, and you're here, back in good old New York, and you're mm -hmm. here in our studio, and I welcome you enormously. Congratulations on the 305 days and the setting the world record for man and woman on a thing. That's a, that's no small matter. And, and what an adventure you had. Yeah. Now, why don't we just got a couple, few minutes left. So you've done that, and then Reed now is on his own, on mm -hmm. the Anne, and he's out there in the great oceans of the world, and share a little bit where things stand uh, for him. And he's still uh, set on setting the thousand-day record on his own, on his own. Mm -hmm. So let's, all the attention of the world should be paying attention in a serious, steady way. We should have on the news every night a report <laughs> from Reed. But uh, share with us um, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So, um, so Reed decided to go on uh, with the voyage. Mm -hmm. uh, he had already accomplished 300 and some odd days, and, mm -hmm. and there was a uh, little less than 700 at the time to go. So that's about two years, mm -hmm. or a little less than two years uh, left. And he had to figure out in himself whether he really thought he could do that. And uh -huh. he, he thought that he could. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's out there now. Um, he just passed one of the capes of New Zealand, and he's going into the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. It'll um, be calmer there, you said, maybe? Um, yes, in lower latitudes, it'll uh -huh. be calmer. Okay. Uh -huh. um, but uh -huh. he has to follow the winds and the currents for the moment yeah. to get into position. Does to he have an onboard motor or not, if you need? Yes. It. Yeah, okay. yeah, he has a motor, but um, the motor is not very Just useful in propelling the boat yeah. at sea because it uses a lot of fuel to, and you don't sure. get very far. Right. It's, it, you it's just, better to sail. You're going by, by, by sail. And he's going to be sailing yeah. like that and uh, 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 setting that record. It must be... It's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing adventure to me. And that he's had this contact, and I think it might be worth it, that we are in, in some considerable ways in touch with Reed on this fantastic venture. I mentioned to you before, he's going to be uh, one of the great explorers in the sense of testing human limits mm -hmm. and so forth at the Explorers Club and other circles that will recognize all that. If he, I think it's already ready to be recognized what you've accomplished. That should be recognized as an amazing feat, and I congratulate you enormously you. on doing that and helping him to do it, and you wish him all the best. Now, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, he's out there in the ocean. You have got, they've got a site. We ought to let them know, 1000days.net, right? Mm -hmm. And talk to that a little bit, and then uh, let's talk about the communication and so people can be familiar with this amazing fellow. They've already met the woman who helped him get through 305 days, and he's mm -hmm. been over a year now, and he's going. So set some of that in, in place, yeah. if you could work. Well, we have a website, um, 1000days.net. That's 1000days.net. Mm -hmm. um, on the website, we have a uh, almost daily blog. Mm -hmm. And for the time that I was on the boat, uh, or roughly, I would say, the first 200 days, mm -hmm. there was probably a daily blog. Okay. Every day, we wrote something, and we sent it through our Iridium. And there were Iridium. pictures. Yes. 
we sent a, a small, short message with a picture mm -hmm. that we took that day yeah. um, and through the Iridium satellite telephone, mm -hmm. and it was posted on our website. Mm -hmm. And so you can see when we caught our first fish, uh -huh. um, when we caught water. And it's all um, archived there. Yes. and you Go. Can, <laughs> by all means, go. It's one of the richest sites. I would encourage everyone to go, and it's going to become a more and more crescendo of interest in this, I think, as we get uh, you know, further in time. Go ahead. Yeah. So there are also um, uh, our impressions of the sea and, and um, well, mentions of when I was seasick and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And yeah. when I got off, Reed continues this, although he does it only twice a week now, just about. But um, he also sends messages, I'm working on the sails at this moment, the sail tour, now I'm ha I have to sew it and Say fix that. it. There's a lot of work it takes to keep that boat <laughs> yeah. going. And, yeah. it, and it's hard. You have to lock the steering wheel in place. Or, or you call it, the, what do you call it, the tiller? No, uh, whatever. Steering wheel. I'm pretty <laughs> landlubber, I'm afraid. But your steering wheel in place and then you have to do work and there's a lot of work repairing sales making sure everything's in order and all mm -hmm. that it, it's it's a, a very very oh, yeah. involved it's, it's a lot of work it's a very physical physical act he's in great shape oh yeah he yeah. has to be you're in good shape <laughs> yeah. right well yes <laughs> <laughs> good yeah good yeah right yeah, I'm in better shape now after I've gotten off the boat and got my weight up a little bit. Oh, I, I yeah. got off underweight and uh, it was a bit frightening. It, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, right, that kind of thing. So you did this, so it's a great adventure. So he's out there. Must. What about lonely or, 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 or lonely or words like boredom? Oh, Does no. it become? No. Okay. <laughs> we were never bored. Mm -hmm. uh, there was always things to do. There mm -hmm. were always things to see. And, and there was never a dull moment, I would say, because uh -huh. there's, you're living in, in a place that danger is ever present. Okay. And you always have to be aware. That's, again, the explorer quality. Yeah, you always have to be aware of what you're doing, what the boat's doing, and mm -hmm. what the weather is doing. Right. Because you have to respond to the weather all yes, the time. Yes, all the time. 24-7, yeah. even, mm -hmm. you know, at night. Even when it's, it, aren't there days where it's just fine, everything's fine? Like there are days when there are calms, yes. Mm -hmm. And then those are the days when we do the things we couldn't do when it was more rough. Mm -hmm. So we're still busy. Yeah. Um, you know, those are the days when you start organizing things or cleaning or getting under into tiny spaces where yes. you didn't want to go uh -huh. when the boat was moving yeah. with more motion. Yeah, exactly right. Take advantage of those things. Again, right. being very organized and everything like that, that was very good. And uh, you have to do all that. So he's now, and he's sending out these messages. I wonder if we could repair to that again. He's got a ground crew. You're part of the mm -hmm. ground crew now, yes. I guess. It would mm -hmm. be like they when they went to the moon, they had a, they had a uh, Houston they could go yeah, back. Yeah, we call it mission control. Mission control, exactly. Yeah the term and there is this communication and they're coming back and um, all of that and I, I want to mention get a word in also for Carter Emirate who runs the Hayden Planetarium auto, uh, uh, astro visualization thing because they put on special shows there and that's become that's the largest video display screen in the world and they put on shows and they do every Tuesday they have one that Carter puts on and he's in connection he's part of the ground control crew if I understand, part of that group, and then the web people in that. Mm -hmm. But they put on a show there, and they have a model of the ant, and they're tracking him, and they're tracking where he is, and we know where he is all the time because of uh, global positioning. We What's have, all that? We have a tracking unit called uh -huh. the Met Ocean Tracking Unit, mm -hmm. and it, uh, it, we have a, a, a unit that sends our location back to uh, the to land mm -hmm. uh, every so often. Yes. Um, several times a day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can always see where we are because on our website we also have a map that plots those uh, right. positions and um, you can see our track mm -hmm. as it moves along. So you, so people can follow along with this thing. Right. And then they do have this connection. Do you think they're going to be able to increase the amount of, uh, of uh, telecommunications connected back to the world in any way that could be relevant. It's rather limited. I mean, and it's not like you got the internet or any right. of those kind of things. If right. there had been better support, they might have been able to do that. But it's an amazing adventure story that can be tracked. And these people are doing it. And the show they put on at the Hayden Planetarium right. is worth mentioning. Right? Um, uh, the first Tuesday of every month is um, uh, the planetarium has a show called The Virtual Universe where mm. they explore um, 
Earth in context mm -hmm. with the rest of the universe. Yeah. And um, also mention is made of, well, the upcoming mission to Mars yeah. and how it takes three years to do that. Yeah. And then at the end of the show, um, Carter will say, well, um, you know, this is, this is very uh, pertinent to another explorer who's on Earth, who's uh -huh. doing a space analogous experiment, yeah. and um, he His calls name. it the Mars Ocean Odyssey. Right, that's what he called it, yeah. And, and that, of course, is Reed out there right, in the middle of Reed. the oceans of the world, and then they do have a connection with him right. then that correlates with that. Right, and then um, Reed will call in at an appointed time, usually at the end of the show, mm -hmm. and the audience members will have the opportunity to ask him questions. Really? That's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. That could become, how long does that, does that last for a few seconds or a couple minutes or what? Uh, just a few minutes. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh, and, and he has a model. Of yeah, the ant yeah. That on is the plotted. on the planetarium dome, you can see the uh, a digital model of the schooner ant, mm -hmm. and also there are satellite photos of where the ant is currently located. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the last show, there was one uh, a same day satellite image up mm -hmm. on the screen. And Reed was on the phone, and he says, yeah, the weather is just fine. I see some wispy kinds of clouds. And then on that image, you can see the exact wispy clouds Isn't that, that he was looking Isn't at. You know? The communication, the educational potential uh, yeah. of that is enormous. I remember we went and visited with Carter, and they're interested in communicating with people about the wonder of what's going on. In, and they have not only the astro aspects, but the, the Earth aspects. It's the most educational, and it's the best display screen, and they're going to incre increase the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the clarity of everything they can present, audio and vi visual, by 50 times because of the things that are coming. It's going to become, the planetariums are really important, and why not best to have uh, in, in their sight Reed Stowe out there in the oceans of the world setting a pattern that I think all the world is going to become monumentally interested in and, uh, and the story of uh, Sonia, who helped him so mightily in that set records of her own, but helped set this record that he's going to go on to set. It's a tremendous story, and I think all mm -hmm. the world is going to become overwhelmingly interested in that. And we're interested in public access because we're trying to communicate about high adventure and wondrous human achievement and so forth. And you've been part of that, mm -hmm. and Reed continues in that, and I congratulate yeah. you all in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we got a few more minutes left. What more? We got a, well. Actually, we're coming. We're almost ready to run the credits and so forth now. But it's so good to see you again. If you get a chance, just give Reed my very best regards, okay? Sure. And we're going to be putting this up on uh, cable television here in New York, and we'll put up contact where people can get in touch with you. And we ought to mention Paul Slackus. Who are some of the other people that are part of Ground Control? Uh, that uh, you're in touch with and how we get in touch or be in touch with uh, Reed and through them the people that are in touch with him and then how we might be able to make more and more people aware of the amazing adventure story you've been part of and that Reed continues. Mm -hmm. Well there are so many people involved with helping with the project it would yeah. be hard They're to all name good. <laughs> it would be hard to name them all mm -hmm. you know but uh, mm -hmm. they have our eternal appreciation for uh -huh. sure. Uh -huh. Without them you know what would we do? Yeah. Um, but at the same time uh, you can go to our website and yeah. contact Reed or um, uh, if you have an interest in education or an interest in the press or um, anything like that, you can